Funding for the Islip Arts Council's Historic Homes and Houses of Worship is made possible by the generous support of the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation. Learn more at rdlgfoundation.org. I would like to welcome you all to St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Islip, New York. We were founded in 1847 in that early era the wealthiest people in New York flocked to Long Island and built estates and farms along the Great South Bay. One of those was William Kissemi Vanderbilt and his estate Idlehour. He became, of course, a member of St. Mark's, which was the closest church to his, to his summer home. And because the Vanderbilts were here, more wealthy folks from Manhattan came out and built estates along the South Shore. Not only did we have the Vanderbilts here, but we also had the cuttings. And of course, their house and is still there. It's now owned by the state. They had a wonderful arboretum that is still a great attraction. Along the way, William Vanderbilt wrote a little postcard, which we still have in our historic archives. And all it says is simply, St. Mark's needs a new church. I'll pay for it. St. <laughs> Mark's Rectory, right next door to the church, was also built in 1880. Both were designed by Vanderbilt's favorite architect, Richard Morris Hunt, who was the most famous architect in the United States at that time. He designed the facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the base of the Statue of Liberty, Breakers, Biltmore, Marble House. His work looks like European villas being dropped into America, which is exactly what the wealthy in America wanted. They wanted to be seen as aristocracy. Kissemi Vanderbilt, he immediately called his friend Louis Comfort Tiffany and said, I want you to do the stained glass for the church. Tiffany had never done church windows before, so this became his first ecclesiastical glass. We have several of his original 1880 glass as well as later glass that is just extraordinary. Everything in the building has a touch of Norwegian. There's gargoyles on the roof. There's multi-roof planes. They've done wonderful scalloping on all the woodwork so it catches light and it doesn't look heavy, it looks very light. It's also kind of interesting that most of the, the wood is very humble. It's cedar, it is yellow pine, and it's interesting because yellow pine was only found down south, and who owned all the shipping and freight from down south? William Vanderbilt. <laughs> so the pine came up from down south on his trains or boats. The pulpit and the high altar are mahogany, and they're highly carved and quite beautiful. Where I'm standing is in the sanctuary, literally all original from 1880. St. Mark's, when it was dedicated on the 4th of July in 1880, the who's who of New York came to this church, the Astors, the Rockefellers, Augustus Belmont. 1989, December, there was an arsonist fire here at St. Mark's and it was devastating. The insurance adjusters figured that we lost about 50% of the building. Uh, the good news was there was a sprinkler system here and that's what saved the pews and the floors and the side walls. The Tiffany window expert at the Metropolitan Museum of Art was having dinner with friends three blocks from the church. And he immediately found the chief and said, just let them curl up. What happens is the lead melts from the heat. Some glass will fall out, others will roll up like a scroll of paper. They can be taken apart and not break any of the glass. But if you try to unroll them, you'll shatter the glass. And because of that, it spared the stained glass. And for two weeks, parishioners came through and sifted the ash to find like 98% of all the original glass. And another serendipitous piece of this story was a local photographer just the month before had taken wonderful photographs of all of our windows. And those were the pictures used by the stained glass window repairs to rebuild all the windows. So after that fire, St. Mark's immediately said, we are going to rebuild. There was lots of thought, this is now only a time we can expand the church and change it, maybe get some side aisles, make it wider. And they decided, no, we had to replicate what we had because it's so gorgeous. We'll just add more services if we need more space. So that's a very quick history of St. Mark's. Part of this event 
is going to be a classical music concert with Serenade Duo. So I hope you enjoy the music. This unique program we put together during our pandemic lockdown, and it features all contemporary composers who have written for the flute and guitar. Our first piece is titled Dos Postales Porteñas, written by Massimo Diego Pujol. With that family friendship between the Vanderbilts and the Tiffany's, William Kissimmee Vanderbilt asked Louis Comfort Tiffany to put his windows into St. Mark's, becoming the first church in the world to have Tiffany windows. We still have several of those original 1880 windows. So here's, here's one of the interesting stories about Louis Comfort Tiffany that I learned from the Tiffany historians. And we were talking about the high altar glass that is directly behind me. Uh, that glass was replaced by Louis Comfort Tiffany 10 years after he put them in. And he offered to St. Mark's that he would replace them at his expense and raise the quality of our windows. And everyone said, wonderful. Well, what we found out from the historians that Louis Comfort Tiffany coveted his early glass and he wanted them back. Many of them ended up in his mansion on the North Shore. <laughs> 
for his own personal enjoyment. So in the history of stained glass, Tiffany invented some things that didn't exist. He used opalescent glass, which absorbs light. The sunlight doesn't shine directly through it. The glass absorbs the light and then it glows and it gives a wonderful, alive feeling to his windows. He also invented a new way of putting glass together. Uh, since the Middle Ages, stained glass artists would use lead caning, which were, which were casts, bits of lead, that allowed glass to be set in, think of a capital H kind of shape, and the glass could go in on either side. Tiffany would wrap each piece of glass uh, gently with copper, burnish it down tight to the glass, and then covered in lead, and then you could put them together, and it gave you very delicate lines instead of thick lead lines. You could get much more artistic with those thinner lines. Most stained glass, the artists, they, they create the cartoon of the window, they lay the glass over the cartoon, and then they paint it, not with paint paint, but with a glaze, and when you bake it, it fuses into the glass to give it its, its color. Tiffany rarely used any painting techniques. His glass was hand-selected to fit exactly the effect he wanted in, in the image. Uh, and it was a very costly technique because you wasted a lot of glass. One of the products he invented to make up for the, all the lost glass using this technique was Tiffany lampshades. <laughs> if you call the high altar glass one window, we have 18 stained glass windows. Of the Tiffany's, we have the trifoil window above the back door, the famous lily window, which is the most popular stained glass church window Tiffany ever made. You can find it in every state in the Union. Then we've got St. John's, which is a tip of the hat to uh, the original Episcopal Church on the south shore of Long Island, which was the Queen Charlotte Church. The north transept window is probably the most unique Tiffany window at St. Mark's because it was designed by Lewis Comfort himself. What we see on the left side of the window is an archangel on one knee with a, with a dove in his hand, handing it to Jesus. Jesus is sitting down, he's got the book of life, he's got a pin in his hand, he's got a laurel wreath and a crown. He's won the victory, life of, you know, he's, he was raised from the dead. And it's opposite on the south transept has three angels and they've unrolled the book of life and they're, they have instruments and they're singing of the blessed dead. So it's a pair, they go together. We have a soul, going to Jesus, and we have the angels remembering those who are dead. The high altar windows are very special as well. They're really a centerpiece in any church. And in the middle, we have, of course, St. Mark. Next to St. Mark is the lion. The early Christians applied pieces of the revelation of St. John the Divine to the scriptures. There's four gospels. The gospel of Mark was the lion. Before people could read, uh, visual symbols, stained glass, were very important to teach the stories. Let's talk a little about the Tiffany Lily window because that was Tiffany's most successful ecclesiastical glass. Of course, the Easter lilies are symbolic of the resurrection. And what's so special about the Tiffany Lily window is the combination of colors with the irises at the bottom, those beautiful purples, but the fine detail thousands and thousands of little tiny pieces of glass. So back to St. Mark's fire in our beautiful windows. Most of the windows in the church, the lead melted and the glass fell out. The north transept window, the one that was designed by Lewis Comfort himself, the Tiffany Company took that window and restored it for us. And now we're going back to Serenade Duo for another wonderful tune.
the long-standing rumors about St. Mark's is that Vanderbilt built this church for his daughter's wedding, Consuela. Consuela married the Duke of Marlborough. It was not going to be a simple country wedding. Vanderbilt did not build this church for his daughter's wedding. He built it because he wanted to be seen as an aristocrat and help endow the masses. That's what you had to do. Vanderbilt, when he died, had a hundred times more money than he inherited from his father. One of the curious things I learned about the Vanderbilts was that when Consuela married the Duchess, the Duke of Marlborough, she was given a dowry of $140,000 a month. In today's money, that's a lot of money. Back then, that was that was amazing amount of money. Bradish Johnson's family, his family was from the South and they were importers of sugar, ended up moving out here to the South Shore of Long Island and being on the vestry at St. Mark's. And before the Civil War started, the Johnson family took most of their money, gave it to Bradish, and sent him to New York City, where he heavily invested in New York real estate. At one time, he was the largest real estate landowner in Manhattan. And he has several lovely windows that he donated to St. Mark's for his family. The Cutting family, Bayard Cutting, and he owned all the property from the Great South Bay up to Sunrise Highway. The Cuttings built the first golf course in New York on their property. There were 12 members. <laughs> the Vanderbilts were one of the members. If you'd like to learn more about St. Mark's, you're welcome to come. Give us a call at the office. We can arrange a tour anytime we can. All right, now we're gonna go back to Serenade Duel. Thank you so much for taking the time to share some music and art today.